This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged News and Views this week with our special guest, Jarrett Walker. This is part one of our interview with him. He's one of the world's leading transit planners and consultants and has worked with transit agencies around the globe to help them make sure they're meeting the current needs of their customers and rebooting bus routes. I think you'll find this a fascinating interview. Be sure to stay tuned for that. First off, we'll come to you with some big news from the public transit industry. And then at the end of today's shows, we'll take a look at the future public transportation with a couple of locations I'm going to be at, giving away free autographed copies of our new number one best-selling book, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation. We'll tell you all about that at the end of the show, and we'll all be in London and L.A. over the next few weeks. But first, headline news from the public transportation industry. The big news this past week was that the company Transdev will acquire First Transit Incorporated under an agreement that will see competencies from each company, quote, ideally positioned to capture the organic new growth opportunities resulting from the increasing need for renewed mobility solutions. Financial terms of the transaction were not disclosed, and both Transdev and First Transit will continue to operate independently until the deal is closed. Transdev Chairman and CEO Terry Mallett said, by joining forces with First Transit, Transdev will be adding new services and expertise to its U.S. and Canada operations. This acquisition is highly complementary in terms of regional presence and solutions offered. He continued, it's also aligned with Transdev Group's moving green decarbonization strategy and shows our willingness to continue investing in operational technology and fleet decarbonization to provide even safer and more environmentally friendly transportation services to communities in the two countries. Transdev says its expertise in fixed route bus and presence in rail, combined with First Transit's complementary positions in shuttle services and paratransit, will provide an enhanced public transportation offer in the U.S. and Canada and further enable the development of mobility services within local communities in the two countries. With the ongoing transition to zero emission fleets in the bus sector, Transdev notes the companies will unlock further growth potential. A new entity's focus on innovation will notably see a growing share of electric buses, further contributing to the reduction of its carbon footprint. Transdev's moving green decarbonization strategy targets by 2030 a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and a 50% increase in alternative fuel fleets such as gas, biogas, biofuels, electric, hydrogen versus their 2018 levels. The transaction will also provide new professional development opportunities for employees of both companies, they say. U.S. CEO of Transdev, Laura Hendricks, stated, I'm excited about the opportunity to combine the talents and expertise of Transdev U.S. with First Transit. This move will greatly benefit our clients and passengers with their daily mobility needs by delivering high-quality services and allowing a faster transition to sustainable transportation. She continued, we look forward to welcoming First Transit's employees to Transdev and showing new clients and partners how we will deliver on safe, sustainable mobility solutions. I hope to have Laura Hendricks on the podcast for an interview later this calendar year. This is the second acquisition for First Transit Topco Inc. In about 16 months, EQ2 Infrastructure closed on the purchase of First Transit and its school transportation arm First Student in a $4.6 billion group with First Group PLC, but First Student is not part of the Transdev acquisition. Cincinnati-based First Transit was founded in 1955 and transports 300 million passengers annually in North America. EQT Infrastructure explains that under its ownership, significant investments were made in First Transit, bolstering the company's organization, operations, and digital technology platform. First Transit CEO Brad Thomas said, over the past few years, First Transit has continued its track record of growth, creating value for our investors, passengers, partners, and employees. As we embark on this new chapter with Transdev North America, we thank our partners at EQT for investing in us and our mission. We're excited about the future and look forward to what's ahead. So big news, Transdev acquiring First Transit here in the U.S. and Canada. Switching now to Washington, D.C., the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA, 
has begun fair enforcement as of November 1st, where Metro Transit police officers could issue citations of $50 to $100 to violators. The enforcement follows a month-long campaign educating riders that WMATA's system requires a fare as well as potential fines should they be caught without a valid fare. At the start of the awareness campaign, WMATA General Manager and CEO Randy Clark explained, quote, there are costs associated with running the community's transit system, and therefore the necessary revenues must exist to deliver services the community needs. WMATA says not only is fare recovery a top concern among riders, but fare evasion was conservatively estimated at a total of $40 million in fiscal year 2022, a significant factor given that the authority is working to bridge a nearly $185 million shortfall in its upcoming budget. WMATA explains it's working with local partners to offer resources to make public transit more equitable and affordable, which includes a low-income fare pilot in the district. Other methods that would prevent customers from entering rail stations without paying are being explored by WMATA, and they include fare gate modifications. Prototypes will be installed as a pilot at a selected rail station. Some of the modifications being explored include physical deterrence on top of fare gates and high barriers. And finally, headed up to Boston in the U.S., Steve Poftak will be leaving the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority as CEO with January 3rd, 2023, set as his final day as general manager of the authority. In a letter to MBTA staff, Poftak, a former guest here on the podcast, called serving as general manager, quote, the experience of a lifetime and noted that while he'll be leaving the authority in January, his support of the MBTA and its workforce will continue. He said, while we have faced and will continue to face challenges, I believe in the strength and resilience of the MBTA. As I look back on my four years as general manager, I take great pride in what we've accomplished together. Well, that's it for a look at the headline news for the public transit industry. Now stay tuned for part one of our interview with Jarrett Walker, and stay tuned after that for a discussion of the future of public transportation, where we'll be giving away copies of our new book, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation, and information on Commotion LA and what's happening in London this week. All that on this edition of Transit Unplugged News and Views. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged News and Views this week with Jarrett Walker, consultant and author. Jarrett, thank you so much for being with us today on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, man. Jared, as uh, as you know, uh, heads up a group called Human Transit. His website is humantransit.org, a great resource for lots of information of what he's doing. Jared, tell us basically what you do for those who maybe aren't familiar. Well, I um, I run a consulting firm called Jared Walker & Associates, and we are specialists in anything to do with network planning, network thinking about public transit. Much of our work is um, redesigning bus networks. That's one of the things we're famous for. But we do a variety of other policy and executive consulting and training, mostly relative to thinking about um, public transit networks and um, how they relate to infrastructure and how to make good decisions about what kind of service to run, where to go and how and how frequently and how that all adds up to a network. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, and that's very important stuff for us here in the transit industry, especially now coming out of COVID. You know, we've had a period of 18 months to two years, depending on where you live, where you've been in lockdown. And to me, mobility is the opposite of lockdown. And so we got to make sure we're getting mobility right right now, wouldn't you think? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Jared and I have known each other off and on. I mean, haven't really talked a lot, but no, have known of each other for many years. I was first introduced to Jared. Uh, through Tom Lambert in Houston. Um, when I was CEO of MTA in Baltimore, we wanted to reboot our network. Jarrett and I were just talking offline how that I remember in 2016, all the CEOs at APTA went down, I think it was to Florida, to a CEO conference. And everyone, you know, I don't want to say the hair was on fire, but metaphorically speaking, you know, what are we going to do? You know, this is like the sixth or seventh year in a row we've had reduced ridership. The politicians aren't going to fund us if we keep having less riders. And they say, why should I give you more money for less riders? And Jarrett worked with uh, the Houston Metro um, in Harris County down there to reboot their bus networks. And um, 
to me, it was a demarcation line in the public transit industry in the last 20 years, because after you did that, Jarrett, uh, and worked with their staff there, tremendous things happened. They started to see an uptick in ridership. I remember that, I think it was 2016. And then in 2017, seven more cities kind of followed that model, uh, Vegas and a few others, and then 18. And then 19, finally, ridership was up across the industry. Tell us what you did. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I don't want to sound like an action hero here. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't do Houston all by myself. Right. Uh, I it was a great team involving a, a great Texas firm called TEI that handled um, all of the local that they handled a lot of the no, local knowledge. There was a great team of local partners um, in outreach, uh, partners from academia, um, and there was also some really effective board and staff leadership. I would particularly call out Christoph Spieler, who without whom it definitely would have not happened. He was the Houston Metro board member who took ownership of the project and sank his teeth into it and would not let go and um, essentially, you know, educated his fellow board members and was able to bring a majority of them along in this um, really big redesign of the network. So what I did in uh, leading the, the design work was to look at an existing network that had, that was an understandable response to the Houston of the 1950s or 60s. It was a largely radial network. Almost all the buses went downtown. Um, the buses were in some sense, and some were mostly not very frequent. They were not very well connected with each other. It was very difficult to make trips where the beginning and end weren't on the same bus route. And um, above all, I would say, um, the city had become multi-centric since this bus network had been laid down. It was overwhelmingly focused on downtown Houston, but if you know Houston, you know that there are actually several downtowns. You look at over Houston and there are several clumps of, of quite large towers. In fact, the tallest building in Houston is not downtown. So there was a need, obviously, for a much more polycentric system, recognizing that you know, the city had much more the shape of Los Angeles now and um, needed a more of a Los Angeles shaped transit system, which is to say, you know, all directional and focused on uh, trips to and from places all over the place because there isn't a single center. So what we did in this extraordinary collaboration, and I was essentially facilitating contributing ideas and, and we, we were doing analysis, um, we erased the whole thing and, and through it completely differently. And I think one of the things that's unusual about this project compared to a lot of the other network redesigns I've done is how completely we needed to erase what was there. What was there was just completely wrong. And it's not to say that we aren't still running on a lot of the streets they used to run on, but the whole structure was wrong. And so we redesigned the system from scratch. We said, what does the city look like now? What are the travel patterns now? What can we infer from the land use patterns now? And it turned out that what we needed, much like, you know, again, you know, something like what Los Angeles already has, which is a high frequency grid pattern that um, makes it possible to travel between any two points with a single transfer. And um, that make and as much as, as could be afforded, that makes that possible at high frequency with a short rate. And actually, you know, there are many other this this happens to be an immensely efficient um form of network structure where you have an anywhere to anywhere kind of network pattern, even rather um, downtown oriented places. I mean, you think of Portland, for example, which is a place that's famous for its downtown, has since about since 1982 had a high frequency grid and many of its most product at many times in its history, the most productive lines have actually been non downtown lines, lines that were running perpendicular to the routes into them. Um, we can talk more about why, but the so the point is it was it, it's an efficient structure and it was it was especially right for Houston because Houston had so many centers and needed service to so many different places, not just downtown. So that's um, that's the you know that was our our role and the, I guess the other part of my role working with Christoph was to take the board through understanding that they had to make a choice about how important ridership was to them as the only goal because it's necessary to balance because if ridership were the only goal you just wouldn't go to a lot of places you wouldn't serve a lot of people who are in hard to serve places and i'll talk more about the geometry of that if you like uh and so 
taking the board through that process and getting them to make a decision about how much to focus on ridership um, was was the other really important part of you know what what Christoph and I were doing kind of from opposite sides of the podium uh, in the um, in the board board. It's interesting. Um, the, the big uh, debate, so to speak, I think has been, and I think it's shifting the where the where the dial is landing is this frequency versus coverage. Talk to me about that a little bit. So, um, if the goal of your network were ridership, and I will never tell you that it should be. As a consultant, I am always saying if, right, if this is what you want, then. That's like thinking like a business. And what a business does is choose which markets it will enter. A business does not feel obligated to be there for everyone. It's there where there's a market and where it feels it can succeed. When we allow ourselves to be judged on ridership and when we fall into the pattern of talking about ridership as though it's our only measure of success, we're essentially, our, our transit agencies are getting framed unfairly because they're being judged as businesses, even though they are not businesses, are not, their policy boards are not, um, are, are nothing like the boards of businesses where there's, where everyone has made a commitment to the goal of profit. Um, it's just nothing like that. And because they're not businesses, um, ridership is a, is, is, is not the only thing they're trying to do. You may th- and, and, and you may think that it, that's the only thing they're trying to do. It may seem natural, but as soon as you as you go to a board of directors and show them what their network would look like if ridership were the only goal, you discover that that's not their only goal. <laughs> Even if they haven't yeah. thought about it until then, once they see that map, it becomes obvious that that's not their only yeah, goal. Yeah, because you're leaving off all kinds yeah. of underserved people, right? You're leaving off... Uh, um, uh, basically, so, so the thing to understand here, and now I'm about to say something that will sound like I'm insulting your neighborhood. So let's take this. <laughs> um, there are some geometric things about how a community is laid out, the pattern of development, the pattern of the street network, which determine how many people a bus can serve as it drives through the area. Those are features like density, which is to say how many people and destinations are around in the fixed area around a stop. Those things like walkability, can the people around the stop walk to the stop given the barriers? It includes linearity, which means can the bus drive in a reasonably straight line that other people on the bus will find to be a reasonable path that doesn't have to meander. Um, and those factors are just geometric facts about your neighborhood. They aren't about you. They aren't social or demographic observations. It's just the geometry of how the layout of the neighborhood interacts with what a bus is and what a bus can do. And so if you have high density, walkability, and linearity, a high a, uh, and I want to maximize ridership, I will go to your neighborhood with very frequent service because there I know that if I put down a bus stop, there are lots of people to benefit from it. They can walk to it and I can serve them on a reasonably direct path. Those are all winning features. And so the more service I put there, the more benefit I'm going to get. And from a, from a quote unquote business perspective, a ridership maximizing perspective, that's the thing to do. And that means correspo- corresponding. And so the, the other part of this is that the payoffs of frequency are nonlinear. So I'm motivated to put down a lot of frequency where I've got really good um, transit orientation, where I've got really good density, walkability, linearity. Correspondingly, that means that where I don't have density, walkability, linearity, I am motivated to offer nothing for the same reason that McDonald's as a profit-making corporation is not going to put up a store in the middle of the prairie where there's only like one house in five miles, right? Right. And it's not because McDonald's disapproves of the people who live of the rancher who lives in that house. It's just that they're a business and they're going where people, where there is a sufficient concentration of demand in the form in which they can serve. And that's exactly what high ridership planning does. So, so yeah, a high ridership network is a high frequency network because the payoff of frequency is expen- is, is nonlinear, especially in that range of like getting from a 30 minute frequency up to a 15 or 10 minute. So. So that's the that's the geometry, that's the math that presents us with the ridership coverage trade-off or the frequency coverage trade-off, if you prefer. So coverage is this other thing that we do instead of high ridership service. And for most of my career, I've uh, transit executives around me have talked as though 
well, ridership is what we want to do, but then there's politics and politics sometimes require us to do a low ridership thing. And I've wanted to say, no, wait a minute. Let's just, let's describe this more fairly and neutrally. Let's say that, that competing with a goal of ridership is this other goal, which I call coverage, which is simply people's expectation that you be there for everyone. And when you go out to the public with a proposed network that is ridership maximized, and that deletes service to low ridership places. Those people come to your board and they say, hey, we're taxpayers too. We are entitled to some of this service or we need this service very badly. We won't. And, and when boards say yes to that, they're saying yes to something that is not a ridership goal. And so all I want them to do is say that at the level of policy instead of just saying it one by one as individual issues come up. And so that's why we've always encouraged transit agencies to adopt policy. And you can phrase this policy any of several ways, but the basic idea is tell your staff what the goal is and tell your staff what the balance of competing goals is and um, how much you do want to spend on coverage services as opposed to ridership services. Um, so that then you know, and so that then future service planning decisions can be reported back to you in those terms. You know, okay, we are now, we're, when we make this service change, we'll be, you know, turning the dial toward coverage and away from ridership or vice versa. So the board always knows what's happening because otherwise, they can't fairly judge what's going on because you cannot, you should not be criticizing transit agencies for the low ridership and service whose purpose isn't ridership. That's perfect. That's not the goal. No, and, and that's a great segue to where we're at right now, Jared. Uh, Post-COVID, it seems like there's been a real shift during the COVID pandemic when ridership was decimated, where transit agencies kind of came to a realization of what you just said, you know, that we maybe we want to be a little bit more about coverage and less less about ridership uh, because our commuter services still are, you know, only at 60 percent or less of what they were. And so what's our real reason to get trial? What's our reason to exist? And I think it is to provide access to mobility for all to all of life's opportunities. So coming out of covid, are you finding that agencies are more focused on kind of that equitable inclusive nature of bus routes like the work you're doing at TriMed and other places? Well, let's, let's, I think we can take that apart into a few different strands. Good. Um, first of all, COVID destroyed rush hour. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind-the-scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? Then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube, where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com. Hi, I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. To PR or not to PR, that is sometimes the question. What I mean is, how do you decide if your marketing campaign should use a public relations element? Public relations, or earned media, is the part of marketing in which you contact reporters and ask them to run a story based on information you want to share. While public relations used to be the heart and soul of institutional communications, it's almost never the only communications tactic we use anymore, partly because the digital world has given us so many more communications options. So when should you reach out to reporters? The most important time to contact reporters and the occasion on which your story will most likely be run is when you have something new to talk about. This could be new service, new vehicles, new leadership, any breaking news that your organization can be the best source for. You should also share news when you have something to say that is topical. As you study current events, what can you share from your agency that is relevant? Finally, always keep up with the reporters and news outlets that you would like to run your stories. When you read reporting that you think your inside information could enrich, contact journalists with your unique insights. If you'd like to talk more about when to add PR to your marketing campaign or anything else related to communications or public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Hi, this is Mike Bismarck, Regional Sales Director for Proterra, and this is Mike's Minute. 
where we talk about leadership, mentorship, and kindness with the hopes it'll inspire you to pay it forward. With APTA happening earlier in October and then CUDA in Montreal over the last week of October, it has been great to reconnect with so many of our industry peers and leaders. Like APTA, CUDA also had record attendance, evidence again that people were excited to get back to face-to-face meetings as this was the first CUDA trade show since 2019. It continues to be exciting times as many of our leaders, agencies, consultants, peers talk about reinventing transit and enhancing the ride experience as ridership returns, evaluating both the way and the where we deliver service. However, coming out of the two conferences and on the heels of the fifth anniversary of the Transit Unplugged podcast, I wanted to take a quick moment to say thanks. At this year's CUDA, I was humbled to be nominated to the CUDA Board of Directors and honored to be entrusted by my peers. But back to the thanks. You often hear me talk about many of the great mentors I've had along my journey, and none of this would be possible without them. There's been so many amazing learnings I've been privy to. So thanks to all those who have helped me develop over the years, continue to share insights, feedback, learning opportunities, and simply being kind to me in my journey. I am truly grateful to work in this industry and would like to thank Paul as well. Congrats on your fifth anniversary, the start of season six, and it has been fantastic to collaborate and share ideas with you and your audience. I really appreciate the mentorship you have shown me during our journey that all started back with a simple cup of coffee in 2019. Kindness is cool. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. And now on to the future of public transportation. I'm excited to say that I'm in London this week, uh, moderating three panels at the Intelligent Transport Innovation Summit being held at Twickenham Stadium. We're also filming an episode of our Transit Unplugged TV show and recording some guests from Europe for future Transit Unplugged episodes. While in London, I'll be addressing how the transit industry is moving forward out of the pandemic, how technology is transforming our industry and what the threats are to the public transport industry and how we're responding. We'll be talking about that at the three panels I'll be moderating for the over 500 registrants there. Then also, I want to let you know that uh, the following week, I'm going to be in Los Angeles for Commotion LA. Commotion LA, of course, is a big, exciting event that occurs uh, each year. And uh, I've got a number of things I'll be doing there. Uh, The event is being held November 15th through 17th. On Wednesday, the 16th, I'll be moderating a panel uh, on building back ridership. That's on Wednesday at 11.15 a.m. I'm very excited about it. We've got some great uh, panelists there, including Jennifer Videz, the Chief Customer Experience Officer at LA Metro, Greg Spots, the Director of the Seattle Department of Transportation, David Degason, Vice President, Business Development of Cubic, and Shinpei Tosei, Global Head of Cities and Transportation and Policy at Uber. And we're going to be discussing how we're bringing back riders. That ought to be a great panel. Again, that'll be held at 11.15 a.m. on Wednesday, the 16th. Later that day, I'll be doing a book signing and giveaway on Wednesday, the 16th at 3.20 p.m. during the break at the Transloc booth, who's sponsoring the event. I'll be giving away signed copies of the book. Hopefully, we can see you there. Also be filming an episode of Transit Unplugged TV while we're at Commotion LA. Hope to see you there. Uh, Reach out and let me know if you want to connect while we're in the city. And finally, I wanted to read to you uh, from King County Metro General Manager Terry White. Uh, He has contributed the final summary chapter of our new book, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation. Their blog site and website recently posted an excerpt from the chapter, which I found um, very moving as the whole chapter is. Terry White said, while we don't know exactly what the future looks like, we do know that the car, whether gas or electric, is not the answer. We want to live, work, and play in communities marked by greenery, pedestrian paths, and birds chirping, not widening highways, parking superstructures, and the din of traffic. We need a suite of options across buses, bicycle lanes, on-demand services, rail, and van pools that allow people to move freely based on their interests and abilities rather than endlessly funneling cars into congested travel arteries. That's an excerpt that King County Metro posted on their blog site. And I want to thank Terry White again for contributing the final chapter to our number one best-selling book, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation. Uh, the book is going to be available in print on November 17th um, on places like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other bookstores. It is available currently for digital download uh, on those uh, platforms as well. Hey, thanks for being with us today on this episode of Transit Unplugged as we bring you all the news and the views that are leading our public transit industry. Stay safe out there. 
Thank you for listening to part one of this special two-part episode with Jarrett Walker, Transit Consultant, here on Transit Unplugged News and Views. Make sure you visit transitunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter so you're always in the loop with whatever's going on with Transit Unplugged, the podcast, and the TV show. Now, of course, next week we'll have part two of this great interview. We hope you tune in. But in the meantime, if you have a question, comment, or want to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.